Hello, I'm Jennifer Keller, the Programming Coordinator at the Westport Library with two other Jennifers today. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Jennifer Rosner. Hi, nice to see you. Author of The Yellow Bird Sings, who was scheduled to speak in person at the library earlier this month. And we also have Jennifer Blankfein. Hi there. The Westport blogger behind Book Nation by Jen. They will be discussing Miss Rosner's new book novel, which follows a woman and her young daughter hiding from the Nazis. Now I'll let the other two Jennifers tell you more. Great. Thank you so much. Hi, Jennifer Rosner. It's uh, great to see you. I'm sorry that we weren't uh, able to see you live in person, but I'm so happy that we're here today and we're able to talk about your new book, which I'll show it here, The Yellow Bird Sings. It's an amazing story that um, I had the pleasure of reading before it came out. And I've been talking about it for a very long time and everyone that I recommend it to is loving it. So um, I'm so happy to see you today and to have you tell us a little bit about it. So if you want to start and tell us uh, what the book is about, that would be great. Okay. Thank you so, so much for, for having me. Um, new to virtual interviewing, um, but it's a, a new creative skill that's, that's uh, coming out of our circumstances. Um, so The Yellow Bird Sings is uh, about a mother and her five-year-old daughter who are um, in hiding during World War II in Poland in a farmer's barn. And the little girl is very musical and um, she really feels music pulsing through her and she wants to tap on her mother's leg and hum, but in the barn that she's hiding in with her mother, um, she needs to stay entirely silent. So she conjures a magic bird um, that she holds cupped in her hands and she, and this bird sings the songs she feels inside of her and hears inside of her. And um, her mother in trying to pass the days and minute, you know, the minutes, hours and days, um, she tells a story, whispers a story nightly about a brave little girl and her bird who avert threats and find safety. And um, this goes on um, as long as it's safe to stay in the barn, but the moment comes when a, it is no longer safe and the mother needs to make a very difficult choice about whether to um, try to find a new hiding place with her daughter or else uh, put her daughter in the safe place alone. Um, and I think that at heart, this novel um, is really about a very powerful bond between a mother and child. It's also about the role of creativity and beauty in human survival. And um, yeah, I mean, as, as I said at the start, you know, um, you know, it, we're in this interesting circumstance now where we're quarantining or isolating. And um, one thing I do think is that um, you know, we can keep it in perspective when we think about other situations in which people have, have had to be isolated or in hiding, um, as in uh, my story. Yeah, I think people today, now that we're, we're all alone and we can't live the way we want to live, people are reading your book and really understanding the characters even more than they normally would because we're getting a tiny little taste of what it's like to have somebody say you can't live and do what you want to do. Um, how did you come up with this idea? I mean, you were not in isolation. <laughs> so how did you, how did you think of this? Um, well, so the seed of this story came actually about 10 years ago when um, I had written another book. I had written a memoir called If a Tree Falls and I have it here to show. Um, so people can see what that looks like. Um, this book um, is about deafness in my family. Um, I have two daughters who were born deaf and that was a kind of a shock for us. We didn't expect that. I mean, you know, you, um, you take your, you eat your kale and you take your giant prenatal vitamins and you, you know, and whatever fears you have, you know, um, that deafness wasn't one of them, but then my daughters were born deaf and we learned later in my ancestry that there had been deaf, deaf relatives. Um, also, we're both recessive carriers that we didn't know about either. But um, 
But I had written this memoir about raising our deaf daughters um, in a hearing speaking world and our decisions to get them hearing technology and to do listening and spoken language. And um, I was at a book talk for my event uh, for my memoir and I was talking about how we were encouraging our children to vocalize and we were actually celebrating every, every single sound they made. Mm -hmm. And a woman in the audience um, described her childhood experience of having to stay entirely silent hiding with her mother during World War II. And um, I thought a lot about her as a child and also about her mother having to keep her entirely silent, um, kind of needing to make her child vanish. And the, the, the project was like the exact opposite of what I was working on as a new mother, trying to get our children to make sound. And it just stuck with me and I thought a lot about it. And from meeting her, I ended up meeting several hidden children, started interviewing you know, these are adults who were at, hidden um, as children during the war, um, just became really fascinated by it. And um, yeah, did that's the seed of the novel, yeah. Did any of those hidden children, did they tell you their stories? Were they, what were their stories like? Yeah, um, I'm, they did. Some, many told me stories. Other people I contacted didn't feel they could talk about it. Or some of them would invited me to hear them speak to high school groups like on a script, but didn't feel comfortable at being asked questions. So there was a range of ways in which um, I was in touch with hidden children, depending on comfort level with, um, with sharing those experiences. But the ones that I did interview, I mean, there was such a range of experience and there was so much resilience and ingenuity in every story. Um, you know, there was one person who had like been carried in a suitcase over a ghetto wall and someone who had been hiding in plain sight, um, you know, wearing a cross and carrying false papers on a neighbor's farm. Um, there was a, a boy who lived in an attic, um, like a barn attic above near a school and he would watch children go into school. The littlest children were able to still go to school, watch kids going to school and then playing in the yard. And meanwhile, he was stuck in this tiny little space looking out through a crack in the wall. Um, and I, there was a woman, you know, who was with her mother in a, in a barn loft actually. And, um, yeah, just all kinds of experiences. So many. And, and, uh, you know, I think that, the emotionality was so high. I mean, it was really a moving experience and I'm still in touch with them and we'll stay friends, I think, with them because we really, um, I feel honored that they shared their stories with me. It, it's amazing because I, I think the conversations that you had had with these people really uh, created a richness in the story. Um, and research often does that, but this was sensitive research. Um, which really made a big difference. I think it, it uh, enhanced the story quite a bit. What other research did you do for this? Um, well, I went to Poland and was really lucky. I found a guide, I researched and tried to find a guide who would take me places in Poland where I knew I wanted to go. But this particular guide who I found, he read my manuscript in advance and he took me like to the settings of my novel in this amazing way, it took me to, um, you know, a barn that had, you know, where a Jewish family had hidden. He, he took me to a convent where there were, you know, where Jewish children had, had hidden and to an area of forest, like a primeval forest where Jewish partisans had camped. Um, and also at night, he sat with me and um, he translated memoirs and other um, different kinds of writings that were only in Polish that I couldn't have access accessed on a background. He was incredible and really, um, it, was, it was such a meaningful trip. And um, I also went to Israel, I went to Tel Aviv and um, was able to meet a violin maker since my daughter, the, the character who's the young musician is a violinist um, and her, her grandfather's a violin maker. And I, I went to this violin maker's studio and um, it was an amazing experience because this man, his name is Amnon Weinstein in Tel Aviv, he rebuilds um, violins that have been like salvaged from the Holocaust. So he has, you know, he told me about a violin that, um, you know, was brought to him, it had ashes inside it. Um, he rebuilds the violins and they play around the world in, in something called Orchestras of Hope. 
Um, so it was an amazing experience also. And along the way, I also needed to consult with, you know, I have a master violinist I've been consulting with and a mushroom tracker and a, and, um, a mushroom forager rather, and a tracker of how you could move through the woods without making any um, visible change in the, in the topography. And um, yeah, you know, you end up Wow. learning so much and 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 up sort of strange directions where where if someone ever looked at your uh, google history they'd be kind of astonished but this is what novel writing <laughs> leads you to i think a lot of it probably didn't get into the book <laughs> yeah yeah exactly there's so much so much that ends up on the cutting room floor but now why did you um, why did you choose to have the daughter be a, mu a musical prodigy What's, do you have a connection to music? Yeah, um, so my father was a violinist and I, he practiced every night of, of my life really. Um, and um, I would spend time with him when he practiced and I also trained as a singer. I became, I, I trained as an opera singer and um, something we music is something we shared really. It was like, I think I understood personally the connective power and the transportative power of music. And I think that was why music got in there as a way of connecting this child to her family. Right. Um, how long did it take you to write this book? Well, as I mentioned, that first meeting, the hidden child I met was, that was 10 years ago, it was in 2010. So this, in some ways, this novel has been batting around in, in you know, kernel form, <laughs> you know, for quite a while. Um, and then I did all the traveling and a lot of research. So I don't know, I mean, somewhere between 10 years, <laughs> and, you know, so, you know, 10 years or less, but, uh, but right. you know, it's been in my mind a long time. Yeah, I mean, of course, the actual writing isn't, you know, it doesn't take you 10 years, and I've written s several things in between, but, um, but it's really, I've lived with it for 10 years. Yeah. So there's a lot of uh, little elements in the book that were choices of yours, like the characters' names or the bird being a yellow bird. How do you come up with those types of choices? Yeah, um, I mean, I knew I wanted a bird um, and that the story behind that is that um, I heard of a child who in a sort of in response to a trauma had cupped her hands had she had gone silent and cupped her hands. And when I was thinking about the character of Shira, I thought that her having a bird who could express, um, you know, the music inside her and somehow kind of enact a childhood that she was kept from having seemed right. When it came to uh, whether the bird would be yellow, um, I think that, you know, initially I thought of yellow as a friendly color, sunny color, um, you know, kind of a bright and brilliant color, but I'm sure that unconsciously there was the yellow star in the back of my head. I wouldn't have articulated it right away. I think a lot of novelists' decisions have to do with unconscious connections um, that only later they realize were there. Um, and, you know, liter literature people, you know, um, attribute. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I think a lot of it's intuitive. Um, it, it has been for me. And sometimes like with the names, you know, you, you try out a name for a while and then you realize that has to go or, you know, you might change. But Shira, the word is um, the Hebrew word for song. And I liked that as a name for the daughter. Um, and the name um, Rosha actually came in an interesting way. Her name, initially the mother's name was Anya. And when I sent my manuscript to the Polish guide, he said, you know, Anya is a perfectly reasonable name, but um, it has economic connotations that I don't think your character, um, you know, would have. So meaning it was a richer name than my character. <laughs> Um, that kind of detail known from being in my, you know, on my window seat in Western Massachusetts writing my novel and Googling Polish Jewish names, um, which, you know, sometimes leads writers, you know, into, <laughs> you know, becomes difficult because you can be less accurate than you want. But I was happy to have been able to cross check a lot of details um, with various sources, you know, um, in, in the fields like of the Holocaust historian and the, the violinist and then the, tr the trackers, like, you know, I got to cross check my, my work, um, which was really good. Which seems like that was, that was successful and a great idea that you were able to do that and have your research verified so that you're right on track. Exactly. Right. Yeah. 
Um, so I know this is your first novel and you wrote a memoir. You've written other things. Tell us a little about yourself, what you've written, and maybe a little more about your family. Okay. Um, well, so I was a philosophy professor before I became a writer. Um, and I definitely won't bore you with what I've written <laughs> in that field. Um, but, um, but my swan song, though, to, to academic life um, was a strange anthology called The Messy Self, um, which, you know, as a, you know, a lot of philosophers talk about the self and it's, you know, the ideal being a harmonious self or a unified self. And um, I was really interested in the nature of self in its kind of fractured nature and the ambivalence and um, the messiness. And I ended up putting together an anthology that actually left academia, went into, you know, having poets and playwrights and all kinds of other people contributing to it. So um, that's one, that was sort of one of the first things I created outside of the academy or whatever. <laughs> um, and then I, um, then I wrote my memoir, If a Tree Falls, and I wrote this picture book um, which is kind of based, um, it's called The Mitten String. Um, it's a picture book that kind of takes one story from my memoir, which is really the, the most, um, most interesting thing I learned about my deaf ancestors um, when I was doing the research for the memoir is that these two sisters, two women um, in my family who were deaf, when they had um, babies, they tied a string from their wrist to their babies at night so that when the babies cried, they would feel a tug on their wrist and they'd wake up to care for their babies. And um, that was an incredibly important story for me. It was like a model of connection and mothering that, you know, kind of bypassed the whole sound silence barrier that I feared so much as a mother of deaf children. And um, the mitten string is like a children's story about that kind of connection. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, then I, I don't know, I got into the novel and I've spent a long time on that. And now I'm trying to get into a new novel, an entirely new thing. Um, and uh, it's a little, it's been a distracting time, but I'm, I'm trying hard to, to get, get working. What's the new, new book about? Um, say, or... yeah, I mean, in, in its most inchoate phase, I can say that, um, you know, in some ways it's about truths and truths and lies and it's about rising water and, and it's also about a girl who's searching for home. So um, I have an idea about a, about a girl. Um, it's, you know, I had hoped to set my novel somewhere I really want to go next because, you know, the trip to Poland was amazing, but it was like brutal winter in Poland when I went. <laughs> And um, so, but so, but but unfortunately, my next project doesn't turn out to be in Italy or Greece or or um, you know I had you know some place that I, that I've been wanting to go. Um, it's going to be uh, probably on this craggy coast of Maine. It'll probably be cold when I go to visit it. Right. <laughs> but um, but in any case, um, I'm excited. So that's yeah. good. Now, speaking of home, I just want to um, I, I just want to make mention <laughs> that you grew up in Weston, Connecticut, and. Yeah. Uh, so did I. So I figured we should say that because this is for the Westport <laughs> Library. So you are local to us, which is great. Um, I was wondering what you are, what you like to read. What are you reading now? And what do you recommend? Okay. Um, I love reading. Um, I, what do I recommend? I have a lot of things on my shelf and a lot of things that are queued up to listen because in this time that's been somewhat stressful, I find that listening has been helpful for me, relaxing, and I can walk while I listen. So right now I am listening to The Girl with the Louding Voice. Um, it's been taking me a while, but I love it. Um, and um, what else? I've lo I just recently finished The Dutch House, which I loved. And um, did you, I- Did you read, listen to that or did you- I did, I listened to it with Tom Hanks yeah. uh, narrating. He was fabulous. Um, I'm just gonna look at my bookshelf for a second. Okay. <laughs> um. <laughs> Yeah, there's, I, I really loved this book recently called The Secrets We Kept. I don't know if you read it. Um, it was very good. And um, I also really liked The Weight of Ink. Um, that was a terrific was a one. one. <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, I'm, re I, I'm looking, I don't know if you've gotten to read the book of me. It's going to come out. Um, I have, but I month. But um, it's very good. Um, yeah, there's, I have Dear Edward here. I'm a, 
trying to get to reading that. Um, That's a great one. Yeah, yeah, there's so many, you know, there's so many awesome books. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, I think, um, I think we've covered everything. Is there anything else that you would like to say? How can, how can people follow you? I, are you available for, um, for uh, book clubs? Yeah, I would love to do, um, I could Skype or Zoom into virtu virtually into book clubs. I'd really love to do that. I love connecting with readers. Um, if, um, if, 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 let's see, how could I get contacted? I mean, on my website, which is jennifer-rosner.com, there's a contact box. And you can always send me an email that way and I'll get right back to you. Um, I am on other social media, basically thank you to Jennifer <laughs> Blank Five for helping me get on, on Facebook and Instagram. Um, Which I've has really, really been great because I would have to say all of the authors that have had books coming out this month who thought they were going to be on these great book tours and meeting tons of readers and speaking everywhere are all home in their houses. So being on Facebook has been really great. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've watched lots of interviews, including interviews with you. And yeah. uh, it's, it's a great way to be in touch with all different authors. It's, it's a lot of fun, actually. Yeah, it's great. And this is a terrific opportunity. I'm so grateful, um, you know, to the Westport Library for having me. And um, where can people buy your book? We can, I know they can get it at, out at the Westport Library. We know that. <laughs> Yes. Um, and there's also, you know, IndieBound is a terrific site because it can connect you to local bookshops. You can put in your zip code and it can connect you to the local bookstores in your area, or you can buy it through IndieBound. And I think somehow it just supports local independent bookshops. Um, so if you're able to get it that way, that's terrific. Um, it's obviously also on Amazon and at Barnes and Noble and um, you know, it's on Audible. I have a really awesome audio narrator. She's British and she did a terrific job. Um, and uh, yeah. And one more question about the cover. I love the cover. Can you, did you have anything to do with it? Um, I was given two design um, options. This was one of them, except that the, fo the, the picture wasn't torn yet. Um, and then we came up with the idea of tearing it. Um, which I think was good to indicate that something is, is um, off or torn yeah. <laughs> um, in the circumstances of the book. Um, but the designer at Flatiron Books is, is, you know, he's magical and his name is um, Keith Hayes and he just did an amazing job. So it's fantastic. Great. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. It yeah, thank awesome. you. It's my pleasure. So thank, you thank you both <laughs> for sharing so much with the Westport Library and the community. Um, you at home can, as you've just heard, purchase the electronic print and print copies for the Yellow Bird Sings through your favorite retailer while we all practice social distancing. I also want to let you know that this event is presented in partnership with the Federation for Jewish Philanthropy of Upper Fairfield County. For more author videos and information about the Westport Library, please visit westportlibrary.org. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>